acceptance and attitude. That's what we'll be thinking about today. Welcome to another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, as she called us to live to a higher standard each day, to not be satisfied with just throwing a little religion into our lives. That's a shallow substitute. Uh, he wants our best. As this series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, friends, and others who are influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. Today we begin a series called How to Simplify Your Life, which apparently was done after 10 years of Gateway to Joy programs as a summary of what Elizabeth had been telling people on Gateway to Joy. We'll have two Gateway to Joy programs to start out this 10-part series, five weeks total. Accept what God has allowed and choose your attitude. Also today, we'll hear from Kathy Rieg and how Elizabeth was a spiritual mentor. And we'll hear from musician John Hansen about wisdom and doing the next thing. Right now, though, Gateway to Joy 362 Accept what God has allowed. Now, do you ever find yourself saying the same thing over and over again? Well, if so, then maybe you can relate to today's program and what Elizabeth has to tell us. Simplify your life. Doesn't that sound pretty good? Well, how would Elizabeth say that you should simplify your life? First, she says acceptance is one of the keys. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, talking all during this week about some very necessary spiritual principles in my own life. You know, I've been thinking a whole lot about this gateway to joy privilege that I have had for 10 years now. And I find myself saying the same things over and over and over again. And quite a few of my listeners have said to me, Elizabeth, don't ever stop saying them. And sometimes I just think, well, you must just get so bored, which reminds me of a Danish lady that Lars and I met in London. And we just had a brief time with her, but she was an old friend of Lars's mother. And so his mother had said, make sure you visit the Danish lady. And you know, one of the things that she, that she said to Lars and me, as we happened to be on our way from London to Norway, she said, well, I hope you have a nice time in Norway if you don't get too bored with each other. And we've just laughed about that so many times since then. If you don't get too bored with each other. Am I talking to some people who are just so bored with each other, that they don't know what to do. Well, that's one of the things that I'm so grateful for. Amy Carmichael's very simple but very profound word, acceptance. In acceptance lieth peace. So this whole week, I'm going to be talking about how to simplify your life. I hope that there are many people listening who really have been struggling with the whole idea of simplifying their life. How in the world can we simplify our lives when our lives are continually becoming more and more complicated? You know, life does get awfully complicated. Things were much simpler when we didn't have computers. Now, I know you people who have computers just think they're the most wonderful things in the world. And I confess, I have a computer sitting here on my desk. I don't think it's the most wonderful thing in the world. Probably part of the reason I don't think that is because I really don't know very much about it. I don't know how to make the crazy thing work sometimes. But I do want to simplify my life. And one of the ways, and this is right at the very beginning of this list, I have to learn to accept what God has allowed to happen in my life. It is almighty God who has chosen me to live. And I remember my mother telling me quite late in her life that she had had a miscarriage a year or so before I was born. And she said, you know, Bets, I never even thought about the fact that if I had not had that miscarriage, which was a great sorrow at the time, I would not have had you. 
So, of course, I would not be sitting here today looking out of my window at a sailboat and a speedboat, realizing the amazing ways in which God works. In Hebrews 2, 8, and 9, we read, We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Jesus accepted the will of the Father. He was willing to be made a little lower than the angels. Now just stop and think about this for a minute. The angels are creatures made by God. And Jesus was God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons who make up the Trinity. Co-equal, consubstantial, co-eternal. But Jesus, in willing obedience to his Heavenly Father, became a mortal man, was born, as you know, of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. And the third day he rose again from the dead and sitteth at the right hand of the Father. And from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. So the writer of the Hebrews says, we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. In acceptance lies peace. And God is going to give you and me many different kinds of deaths to die. We must give up our right to ourselves. We must accept whatever God dishes out to us. And we must realize that he does it because of his mercy, because of his everlasting love, because he wants to conform you and me to the image of Jesus Christ. Jesus suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. He understands the things which you are just dying over. He understands the little deaths, the major deaths, the big deaths, and then, of course, the real death. And when you lose someone through death, he understands all about that because he has been through it himself. Fenelon, a 17th century spiritual advisor, wrote, Accustom yourself to unreasonableness and injustice. Abide in peace in the presence of God, who sees all these evils more clearly than you do and who permits them. Be content with doing with calmness the little that depends on yourself, and let all else be to you as if it were not. Now that is one definition of how to accept the things that God is laying on you. Now stop and think, what do you need to accept? Something that you have perhaps been arguing with God over, fighting with God over, clenching your teeth, clenching your fists and saying, Lord, I can't take this. How much longer does this have to go on? Are you ever going to give me a husband? Are you ever going to make my husband behave himself better than he's doing now? Whatever the problem may be. Accustom yourself to unreasonableness and injustice. Abide in peace in the presence of God who sees all these evils more clearly than you do. Don't forget that. And who permits them. Be content with doing with calmness the little that depends on yourself and let all else be to you as if it were not. Thomas Akempis said, It cannot be anything but good whatsoever thou shalt do with me. And Amy Carmichael's word, I will accept the breaking sorrow which God tomorrow will to his child explain. Then did the turmoil deep within me cease. Not vain the word, not vain, for in acceptance lieth peace. Do you remember what Jesus prayed when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane? In an agony because he was about to die on that cross. 
But he said, If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But if it is not possible, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That is acceptance. Thy will, Lord, be done. God may be speaking to you today about something which he wills to do in you and through you and for you and by you. And you're saying, Lord, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. That doesn't fit in with my plans. Will you accept what God has given to you to do? You'll find peace. Now there's another one of these simplifiers. It is always possible to do the will of God. Did you get that? I believe that with all my heart. It is always possible to do the will of God. Do you suppose for a moment that God is going to will something which he is not going to enable you to comply with? Well, of course not. You mothers and fathers, you want to train your children to be good men and women, but you're not going to give them something which is impossible for them to obey. Nor is our Heavenly Father. Let's face it, he does give us a lot of things which we think we can't do, and we argue with God. But it is always possible to do the will of God. Now, did I come up with this idea out of my head? No. I got it out of John fourteen fifteen. It says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. If you love me, you will obey what I command. Singing nowadays what are called praise songs, and a whole lot of them are telling God how much we love him. And that's fine if it's really true. But I can't help wondering sometimes when I'm in these churches that major on praise songs, do they stop to think about these words? If you love me, you will obey what I command. Jesus is saying you can sing about it, you can pray about it, you can talk about it, but the only valid proof of love is obedience. It is always possible to obey God. John 15:15 15, 15 says, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father. I have made known to you. This is my command, love each other. Now think about that person that you are sure you cannot possibly love. This is a command. You must love. And John 14, verses 30 and 31, is Jesus' words to his disciples just before he goes back to his Father. He says, The prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me. But the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded. And this same Lord Jesus is going to help you to do exactly what his Father commands. It is always possible to do the will of God. It is a simplifier in your life. Gateway to Joy 362 and accept what God has allowed. The first part in a 10-part series on how to simplify your life. Coming up later, a look at choosing your attitude. First, though, Kathy Rigg, the president of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, talks about Elizabeth as a spiritual mentor. I think of the thousands of individuals that never met Elizabeth, and yet she mentored from afar. I mean, in me only really having that one encounter with her before her dementia, and yet I considered her like my spiritual mentor. God used her writings to touch hearts, to speak to women and men all over the world for decades and people she never met. And yet they were so impacted by her teaching and it took them straight to the Word of God. So their lives were changed. Elizabeth Elliott Foundation President Kathy Reeg. 
Well, later on, we'll hear from musician John Hansen. He'll talk about wisdom and doing the next thing. Right now, though, is it possible to choose your attitude? You choose what you're going to wear. You choose food, but an attitude? Can you really choose that? Well, some ancient principles, scriptural ideas, turn to Philippians 4 as you think about choosing the right attitude. Now, these are ancient principles. There's nothing new, nothing innovative, and certainly nothing that I dreamed up out of my head. I've gotten them out of the scriptures, and I think you'll see that I will back every one of them up with scripture. But the first one that I want to mention today is choose your attitude. Now, we all know perfectly well that we can choose an attitude. We can choose to be nasty, we can choose to be sweet. Let me read to you from Philippians 4, verses 5 to 11, which proves this principle. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned, says Paul, to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every and any situation. Have you learned the secret of being content? It's a necessary one. The same book, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, says your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Now, how am I going to have an attitude which is the same as Christ Jesus? I'm going to have to trust God to help me with that. I think about that sweet little girl who was blinded at birth. Her name was Fanny Crosby. She wrote, someone has said, somewhere between eight and 10,000 different hymns. But she had become blind when she was only six weeks old because of a doctor's mistake. And when she was nine years old, she wrote this poem, Oh, what a happy soul am I, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot, and I won't. Now there's a girl who chose the right attitude. Old Samuel Rutherford, who suffered very, very deeply in Scotland, said, For some it is down crosses and up umbrellas. But I am persuaded that we must take heaven with the wind and the rain in our faces. Rutherford chose an attitude, a willingness to take heaven with the wind and the rain in his face. Ephesians 4.23 says we are to be made new in the attitude of our minds and put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Viktor Frankl, Viennese psychiatrist who was in concentration camp during World War II, gives us a little vignette of one of his days in that concentration camp. He says it had been a bad day. On parade, an announcement had been made about the many actions that would, from then on, be regarded as sabotage and therefore punishable by immediate death by hanging. Among these were crimes such as cutting small strips from our old blankets in order to improvise ankle supports, 
and very minor thefts. A few days previously, a semi-starved prisoner had broken into the potato store and stolen a few pounds of potatoes. The theft had been discovered, and some prisoners had recognized the, quote, burglar, unquote. When the camp authorities heard about it, they ordered that the guilty man be given up to them, or the whole camp would starve for a day. Naturally, the 2,500 men preferred to fast. 2,500 people fasted for the sake of that one. They chose a godly attitude. Jesus said, I am among you as one who serves. My meat is to do the Father's will. Jesus Christ, the Lord of the universe, the creator of the stars, the one who put the hinge on a spider's eye, the one who creates the great sequoia trees in California, he is the one who says, I am among you as one who serves. My meat is to do the Father's will. In other words, I don't have any agenda of my own. My attitude is whatever God tells me. Love your enemies, the Bible says. Do good to those who hate you. Be content with such things as you have. Have you done those three things today? Loved your enemies? Done good to people who hate you? Have you been contented? 1 Peter 4, 1 says, Since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves with the same attitude. Have you ever stopped to think about the fact that you really can choose your attitude? Nobody else has to choose it for you, and it becomes very obvious to people when your attitude is a nasty one. But you can choose a nasty one or a kind one. And those moods... I love Oswald Chambers, you know. He was tough. I mean, that man was tough. And he tells it like it is. And about moods, and we hear a lot of people making a lot of excuses for themselves because they're in a bad mood. You know what he says about that? Moods cannot be prayed out. They must be kicked out. Did you get that? (laughs) Moods must be kicked out not prayed out. And I think of my dear friend, Nay Bailey, who found herself in Poland or Czechoslovakia, one of those places over there, in a station waiting for the train. And as the train pulled in, two very nicely dressed young men came rushing up and asked if she needed some help with her huge suitcase. And she was very grateful. They heaved the suitcase onto the train and then they jumped off and she got on the train, of course, and when she sat down in her seat, she realized that they had rifled her shoulder bag. Everything in that shoulder bag that she counted on was gone. Her passport, her papers, which enabled her to travel in that country, her American Express cards, her checkbook, her cash, everything was gone. And you know what Nay did? What would you do in a case like that? Nay sat down in the seat and simply looked up to the Lord and said, Lord, I don't know what you're going to do about this, but I am going to thank you. And you know, to make a long story short, for the first time in history, as far as anybody knows, everything was returned to her with the exception of 60 American dollars. She had gone to police stations and she'd gone to the American Express office and I don't know where all, but at any rate... Having said, thank you, Lord, her attitude was right, and she received her things back again. That reminds me of Habakkuk. He says, when there are no cattle in the stall, no figs on the tree, no grapes on the vine, yet I will rejoice. That's what it means to choose your attitude. You can simplify your life also by the consolation of obedience, is what I call it. In Ezekiel 24, 15 to 18, and I major 
on this chapter. You've heard me speak of it many, many times. But it bears repeating again and again. In Ezekiel 24, verse 15, we read, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, with one blow, I am about to take away from you the delight of your eyes. Yet do not lament or weep or shed any tears. Groan quietly. Do not mourn for the dead. Keep your turban fastened and your sandals on your feet. Do not cover the lower part of your face or eat the customary food of mourners. Now these were all the usual things which were done in that custom when somebody died. Verse 18, Ezekiel says, So I spoke to the people in the morning, and in the evening my wife died. The next morning I did as I had been commanded. And there's something about the consolation of obedience. You can get all bent out of shape and very upset about all kinds of things. And what consolation comes when we simply do the next thing, the consolation of obedience. I know it because I've been through it. I can remember so vividly the wonderful consolation of the Holy Spirit when my husband was dying because I was doing the simple, ordinary, humble things that need to be done when you take care of a sick person in a home. There were always dishes to wash, meals to make, sheets to be changed, bed baths to be given, pills to be given. In obedience, I found consolation. Isaiah 58.10 tells another story about the consolation of obedience. If you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. I'm going to talk more about that tomorrow, the consolation of obedience. Gateway to Joy 363, Choose Your Attitude, Part 2 in the 10-part How to Simplify Your Life series. Well, before we go and hear John Hansen's music, let's hear from John, a musician and someone who had uh, some thoughts on wisdom and doing the next thing. When I hear Elizabeth's name, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is wisdom. And even through being reintroduced to this project through the doing the music and, and things, I was just really blessed with being able to listen to some of her talks and, and just realize, uh, like re-realize how relevant what she was saying is even, you know, today. And, and so God really, God really used her in a kind of transcendent way, I'd say. And that's awesome. I think that that's kind of was the way that she operated her life, though, and wanted and and other people got to kind of drink from that well per se, because she just wanted to follow Jesus every day. Uh, one of my favorite quotes or or things that that she said is, "Do the next thing." For the place that I'm at right now, uh, I believe that God is calling my family to um, to be missionaries to Japan. I it, that's really been a helpful and and motivating thing for me. I, I even have it on my phone. Um, as I open up my phone, it says, do the next thing. It just reminds me that God is in the present and he's just with us, even when it seems mundane or it just seems like things are just, you know, whatever. That was musician John Hansen who wrote our theme music for our time together. We've just begun this five-week look into simplifying your life. Are you ready to continue with us? Join us next time as we think about doing it now and giving it to Jesus. That's next time. Let me thank you for letting us come into your home, your office, maybe along with you as you get some exercise, wherever we found you today. And on behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out all the many resources available for you at elizabethelliot.org. That's Elizabeth with an S, elizabethelliot.org. 
And until next time, may God remind you daily that you're loved with an everlasting love, and underneath are the everlasting arms. <laughs>